Hey there, this is Kat, day 20 for Joseph. Woohoo! So, anyway, um, I've, I've, my flesh is getting a little out of hand. Let me tell you why. I've read this twice already, once today, once yesterday, and I keep on messing up the words. And the enemy wants me to feel bad that I don't know the words. So what I'm going to say to you is what I should have said on the first video is if I don't know the word, forgive me and we'll just go on with it. All right. I cannot know every single word in the human dictionary. I'm not stupid by any means. I just, it's been a long time since I've been in schooling and, um, and that's what it is. There's my thing and I'm sticking to it. It's like Joyce Meyer says, take me as I am or don't take me at all. So. Now that I said that, <laughs> get my flesh out of the way. Um, just, I've already prayed for the first video, so if you want to take a silent pray, please do. <sighs> calm this flesh. Jesus, please calm the flesh. I hate this flesh. I mean, I, I hate to say that, but I, I hate this flesh. I hate two things being in the same person which is the flesh and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is like awesome and the flesh is just I don't want to kill it every day I just want to kill this flesh and I hate it I so hate it okay done with my rant my tantrum Lord of Jesus I mean at least I'm honest you know I mean I'm, I'm honest I'm not gonna do that hi how are you and you know but just okay forget that part done rambling and I'm on my way okay page 122 after all that I'll give you all a heads up there now there's at least three different words in here in the, in the first page that I don't know forgive me I'll spell them out for you you can get them if you don't know them forget it let's move on all right Now the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house, and they said, It is because of the money that was returned in our sacks, the first time that we were brought, being brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us, and take us for slaves with our donkeys. So they came near to Joseph's house, steward, and spoke to him at the entrance of the house, and said, O oh my Lord, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, and it came about when we came to the lodging place that we opened our sacks and behold each man's money was in the mouth of his sack our money in full so we have brought back it back in our hand we have also brought down other money in our hand to buy food we do not know who put it who put our money in our sacks that was genesis 43 18 to 22. just a little side note i think it's funny how southerners say sacks which is the true biblical term of, of a bag. And Northerners try to make everything short and curt and just bottom line. So I think that it's weird that we took sacks, which is the right term, and we turned it into bag. Not cool. Even though I am a Yankee, not cool. By now, all these grown men were really besides themselves with fear. What was going on with their own guilt magnifying their anxiety? Unresolved guilt always magnifies anxiety. Let me say that one more time. Unresolved guilt always magnifies anxiety. and must be about the money, they thought, and so they began stumbling over themselves, trying to explain the Prime Minister's bilingual servant, William Shakespeare and Henry, King Henry the V1, I don't know if that's 5, 6, 10, 15, what it is, wrote, Suspicion always haunts the guilty mind, if you are feeling guilty over some wrong you have done, everything that happens begins to play into that, causing apprehension and suspicion to pulsate. They're going to find out. Notice what Joseph's brothers feared. He may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for slaves. They had sold their own brother into slavery, and now that it was that they feared for themselves, paralyzed by guilt, they feared the worst when Joseph, dominated by grace, was planning the best. 
Guilt causes us to say strange things at strange times. I remember reading about a letter that had actually been mailed to the Bureau of Internal Revenue. Dear sir, it began, I haven't been able to sleep last year because last year when I filled out my income tax report, I deliberately misrepresented my income. I'm closing a check, sorry, and closing a check for $150. Then came the closing line. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> I already read that, but it gets me every time. That's partial response to unresolved guilt. But he doesn't send him the rest. It should be, you know, get in trouble. Dr. Paul Turnier, a man skilled in medicine and wise in his ways, of faith, wrote an entire book on guilt and grace. In it, he wrote these insightful thoughts and feelings about of guilt. The public generally does not realize how much torment the majority of doctors suffer, nor how much they worry they must have over a case. They are in perpetual state of alertness. Did I overlook some useful point in my examination? Did I make a mistake on diagnosis? Is there some effective method of treatment unknown to me or that I have not thought of? They mull it over in their minds to the point of obsession. Excuse me. Similarly, with the parents of a child who is the victim of an accident, questions crowd in their minds. They weigh their circumstances of the drama which, with, which such a little thing might have obviated. They remember some little fact that they might have taken as a presentiment, but which they didn't bother about. It may seem brutal to say so, but there is no grave besides which a flood of guilt feelings does not assail the mind. Anyone who has dealt with death as much as a pastor does would have to agree that Turnier is right. Beside the grave, you often see guilt written across the faces of the grieving. Could I have done more? Did I do too little? Was that, was that decision right? If I had done something differently, would he have lived longer? Suffered less, though not graveside guilt. These now grown men wrestle with similar struggles. Guilt always does a number on us. It certainly did on Joseph's brothers. Though standing before an unnamed, soft-spoken servant from Egypt, whom they had never really known throughout their lives, they poured out their confession. We don't know how the money got back on our sacks the first time, but here it is. We brought it all back. We also brought additional money to buy more food. That's why we are here, to buy food. Calming response. Genesis 43, 23. And he said, Be at ease. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money, then he brought Simeon out to them. I love the steward's reassuring response, be at ease, he told them. The Hebrew Bible says simply shalom. The steward who knew their well-known language used their word for peace. He said it in effect, hey, shalom, men, be at peace. Settle down, don't be afraid, and this, and then this Egyptian even witnessed to them about their God. Your own God is the one who put the treasure in your sacks. Nobody thinks you stole it. I know what happened. I was the one who put it there. I was the one who had your money. It was a treasure from Elohim, the God your father. They were in agony, wondering when the other shoe was going to drop. Instead, the steward said, Shalom, Elohim has done it again. What a reproof. And by the way, what an interesting surprise that the Egyptian steward understood some pretty sound the theology. No doubt the result of Joseph's influence through the years. He personifies what we considered in the previous chapter, vertical perspective. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Joseph's brothers had never thought to relate to, to relate the return of their money to the abundant grace of God. Why? Because guilt had kept them from seeing God's hand of grace in their lives. Always does. Yet the 
unmerited favor of God had come in abundance to them, grain in abundance, money in abundance, and now their brother Simeon is restored to them, healthy and whole, mercy is abundance. Genesis 43, 24 and 25. Then the men, then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet and gave their donkeys fodder. So they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard they were to eat a meal there. The strange situation had the sons of Jacob totally confused. They had come bearing money and gifts, hoping to buy the goodwill of the Egyptian prime minister. More importantly, they had brought Benjamin, as the man requested. Instead of being asked about any of this, however, they had been taken to the prime minister's home for a feast, where they were allowed to refresh themselves, learn a little theology from an Egyptian steward, and then be reunited with Simeon. Genesis 43, 26 to 28. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present which was in their hand and bowed to the ground before him. Then he asked them about their welfare and said, Is your old father well, of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed down in homage. Excuse me. Suddenly the Prime Minister arrived on the scene. They hastened to present their gifts to him, but he was neither angry nor harsh. He was not marching up and down, breathing threats and demanding to see Benjamin. In fact, he seemed overjoyed to see all of them again. Almost immediately he asked about their father. Was the old man still alive? Was he well? Yes, yes, he's still alive, they replied. He's over a hundred now and still in good health. Despite the official's good humor, sincere interest, and solicitude, I guess they remained uneasy and anxious, still not knowing what to expect from this powerful man. Then came one of those rare moments that, as I mentioned at the beginning of chapter of the chapter, defy dis description. Sometimes it's a little wordy for me, so I'm sorry about that. Genesis 43:29. As he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, May God be gracious to you, my son. Here we have one of the most eloquent sentences in Scripture. He lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin. Joseph looked up and saw his brother his blood brother, for the first time in some twenty years. He saw Benjamin, his mother's son, the only brother to whom he was totally related. Same father, same mother. The other boys were really his half-brothers, but Benjamin was his full blood brother, his only direct connection with his mother, Rachel. Joseph stood there, tears threatening to well in his dark eyes as he gazed upon that beloved face. Excuse me, I get emotional sometimes. Is this the youngest brother you told me about? He asked, struggling to maintain his composure. Yes, this is Benjamin. And Joseph said tenderly, May God be gracious to you, my son. Suddenly this great man, his strong-hearted and efficient prime minister of a mighty nation, collapsed inside. Like the rest of us, great men and women encounter those times in life when they can no longer restrain their emotions. Composure flies away and feels and feelings take control. That was what happened to Joseph at this long-awaited moment in time. It is at such sacred occasions words fail us. Often we need to get alone to gain our composure. Joseph did. And Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Joseph 43.30 I can't imagine. Um... Yeah, can't imagine. Um, can't you imagine the scene? All of a sudden, the handsome bronze leader of millions had rushed into his bedroom and collapsed in sobs. All those years passed in review, all the loneliness, all the loss, all the seasons, birthdays, significant occasions without his family. It was too much to contain, like a rushing river pouring into a lake, swelling above the dam. His tears ran and heaved, 
with great sobs. All of a sudden, he was a little boy again, missing his daddy. I know how that feels. My thoughts rushed to, to other great men in scripture who at times were overwhelmed by their emotions. David, when he lost his precious son, Absalom, grieved as he cried out, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, my son, my son, Absalom. Would I have died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son? It makes you want to cry now. Second Samuel 18.33 Job, who had lost everything, including his children and his health, cried out to God, Let the day perish on which I was to be born, and the night which I said, A boy is conceived, why did I not die at birth? That was Job 3, um, 3 and 11. Elijah, after God's great victory against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, got the threatening word from Jezebel that within 24 hours he would be murdered, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and he said, Is it enough now? It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. First Kings nineteen four. Um, I just want to say what's what's going on. I'm sure you hear a change in my voice is that um I have also said these words. You know, and I'm sure that the many people out there have also said these words and, and you know and I'm glad I'm not the first one <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the first one I'm sorry to, that that happened to those people you know but I don't think that the Lord can truly use you until you're broken. You know. So that was First Kings 19.4. Even the giants of faith had times when they simply exploded emotionally before their God. Consider in greater detail our great spiritual ancestor Moses. He had trekked long miles through the barren wilderness leading to the Hebrews to the promised land. Sorry, leading the Hebrews through to the promised land. Although God had brought them miraculously and safely out of Egypt, the people started complaining as soon as they got across the Red Sea. They were tired of the heat. It never ended. They were tired of the food. It all tasted the same. They were tired of the water. It taste, tasted brackish. I don't know what that is. They were tired of sand and gravel and endless wilderness. They wanted Egypt with all its comforts. Complain, 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 grumble, 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 gripe, gripe, gripe. Oh, that sounds like me. Mercy. <laughs> Sorry. Doesn't that sound like everybody? Sometime in their lives, suddenly, in an outburst of emotion, Moses said, Enough. I've had it. This is Numbers 11, 11 through 15. So Moses said to the Lord, Why hast thou been so hard on thy servant? And why have I not found favor in thy sight? And thou hast laid the burden of his people on me. Who would, Was it I who conceived all these people? Was it I who brought them forth that thou should, shouldest say to me, Carry them in your bosom, and nurse carries as a nurse carries a nursing infant to the land which thou didst swear to thy fathers. Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they weep before me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. Did I say that right? Give us meat that we may eat. I alone am not able to carry all this people, because it is too burdensome for me. So if thou art going to deal thus with us, please kill me at once. If I have found favor 
in thy sight, and do not let me see my wretchedness. Sorry, that's my stomach rumbling. Um, if you want to get If you want to get the full effect of Moses' meltdown, go back and read this passage aloud with feeling. Imagine he's talking to Lord God here, the almighty El Shaddai himself. Did I give birth to all these people? Why, why do I have to babysit them? Where am I going to get meat for all of them? They, kept, they keep whining that they want meat. I've had it. Just kill me, Lord. Let me out of here. Put me out of my misery. Is that any way to talk to God? You'd think that the Lord wouldn't just zap him with a full load of Sinai, lightning and thunder, but he didn't. Because God loves us more than we love ourselves. I have a friend who lost a son. They found the boy drowned at the bottom of the neighbor's swimming pool. My friend and his wife, after the public grief had ended, continued to grieve within. To this day, I remember his saying, There are times we have to choke back the feelings. Shortly after the drowning, he said, I got in a car and drove the Los Angeles freeways for miles. As I did, I lashed out with the words that I would never say outside that car. No one else was there. I just poured out all my feelings. Grief, resentment, anger, confusion. I dumped it all. More than... After more than two hours of that, I drove back home, pulled into my, my driveway, and turned off the engine, my eyes and cheeks still wet with tears. I laid my head against the steering wheel, completely exhausted, then I suddenly was struck with a thought. God can handle all this. Um, yeah, I resonate with that. My, I had a best friend, and her son was tragically shot at the age of 10 four years ago, and um, I had a hard time. I had a hard time with it, why, why the Lord took him, but I think that he saved him from a life that he, that he, he would have um, not wanted, you know, from future heartache. But at that time, I, I asked the same, why not me, Lord? I wanted, I wanted to go. I'm ready to go. You know, but that's, I'm here for a reason. And, and we're all here for a reason. And we could sit here and stomp our feet every day and hold our breath like children, you know. But at the end of the day, we've got to buck up and at some point just say, okay, God, help me to submit, help me to, to be yours and and um, help me to get past all this, this flesh and these feelings and this guilt and this resentment and this bitterness and this hurt, a lot of hurt. I don't know why I threw that in there. Just I guess I felt like it. You know the best part? God will never tell on you. Isn't that great? Isn't it a relief to know that the Lord God will never stand up in a church and say, I am here to announce what she said to me last Thursday morning. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus God. I pray that my life is never in that Bible. People would not like me. <laughs> there have been times in my own life when I had doubts, when I've stumbled over great cracks that appeared in my world. I've had those times when I climbed into my own bed and wept, crying out to God, just as you have. Such is life, especially when you decide to be real rather than to protect some kind of I've got it all together image. Being real is hard. It's comforting to realize we're in good company in times like that, isn't it? Joseph was a great and powerful man, admittedly, but he was also real, a real human being with real human emotions who could step out of the corridors of power and have the strength to weep his heart out. And so the sturdy, capable prime minister of Egypt was overcome with emotion when he saw his younger brother for the first time in so many years. The record states he was deeply stirred and he sought a place to weep. Again, a scene that 
intimate, defiles detailed description, and then, rather matter-of-factly, it goes on to say that he washed his face. He got himself under control and rejoined his brothers and ordered the servants to serve the meal. I love this next scene, he says. Genesis forty-three thirty-two. So they served him by himself, and then by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. Just um, a little bit more. After the deeply emotional moment, there is almost a little humor, a little comic relief in the scene. Joseph was eating by himself, and the brothers were eating by themselves, and the other Egyptians were eating by themselves. <laughs> All these folks were sitting down to lunch in the same place, but they were eating at separate tables. Almost like, um, it, like clicks, you know. The Egyptians could not bear to eat Hebrews. The New International Version study notes say the taboo was probably based on ritual or religious reasons and refers to Exodus 8.26 where Moses says to Pharaoh, the sacrifices we offer the Lord, our God, would be detestable to the Egyptians. That helps explain why they were seated at separate tables. Last one, Genesis 43, 33-34. Now they were seated before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in astonishment, and he took proportions, sorry, and he took portions to them from his own table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. So they feasted and drank freely with him. I'm going to stop right there today. I know it's a long one today, but I, I wanted to get at least eight pages in. This was an emotional one for me today. I resonate with a lot of it, and I'm sure that's why you wrote it, you know. And just one more thing. Um, the, the Lord, um, sorry, wanted me to get dressed up today. Um, so, um, I got dressed up today, and I felt like uh, the Lord was pursuing me to do that. Um, don't know why, but, um, <laughs> here I am. Um, I guess because every other video is kind of, um, like, just my hair's up, but no makeup on, nothing, you know, nice on, like, the shirt and everything. So, I just felt like, I think the Lord just felt like having me dressed up today for once. So it is about 30 minutes and it is way time to stop. So thank you for um, for Joseph Day 20. Day 20. And I'll be back again very soon. And uh, God bless you. And I just, I'm praying that you also take something away from this as I have been. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. And I will see you soon. Just to let you know, this is the March 1st, 2015 Sunday, the Sabbath. Thank you.